closing time, the close of an era. The great big spree, the jazz age, is over, all over. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. Little man, what now? Well, you can always sell surplus apples, five cents a piece on the street corner. And if you're bewildered, panicky at what's happening to you and your country, you aren't alone. One of America's biggest industrialists has openly admitted, I am afraid. Every man is afraid. Prosperity is just around the corner, say the hopeful headlines. But around the corners wind the lengthening bread lines, and a whole new class of citizens appears in American society, the new poor. And when private charity can no longer carry the burden, the states are forced to act. The New York governor, Franklin Roosevelt, is the first to supply direct emergency relief to the unemployed. The same paralysis that lames the cities blights the farms. And out in the country, too, men are asking, what's wrong? What's happening? Farm prices have dropped disastrously, and a man's work no longer brings him a just return. The threat of foreclosure, of losing house and home, spreads through the conservative farmlands, and radical talk is boiling into action. <laughs> In Iowa, the Farmers Holiday Association organizes to block the flow of farm product to the city in an attempt to force prices up. It is illegal action. But one farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too. spreads. From all over the country, unemployed veterans of World War I march on Washington, 15,000 of them. They demand immediate payment of a cash bonus promised them for the future. They need it now. They want it now. But the Senate votes no, and authorities see in the bonus marchers a mob animated by the spirit of revolution, a menace to the nation's capital. Troops disperse the veterans and burn down their shanty settlement. Since the Civil War has such pressure, political, economic, social, centered on the White House. In the face of a hostile press and a divided Congress, Herbert Hoover makes unprecedented use of government power to encourage recovery. But his fundamental faith is in the rugged individualism of the American people and in private enterprise. Economic depression, he says, cannot be cured by legislative action. But the basic causes of the deepening crisis remain stubbornly obscure even to the business leaders summoned to the White House. The explanation offered by humorist Robert Benchley is as good as any. Now, what were the primary causes of the Depression, as we called it? Overproduction, maladjustment in gold distribution, overproduction, deflation, too little thyroid secretion or flax disease, too much vermouth, overproduction, and by the same token, underproduction. Then too, there was the Gulf Stream. All of these helps lead to inflation, deflation, and overproduction, with a consequent depression. Many are beyond joking. 
A report from Detroit says men are sitting in the parks all day long, out of work, muttering to themselves. Some succumb to apathy. Some are swept by alarm, and bank after bank across the country is hit by panic withdrawals. New lines appear on American streets, depositors swarming to snatch out what savings they have left before it's too late. Banks by the hundreds, by the thousands, are forced to close. On the eve of the presidential election of 1932, the whole financial system quakes and totters. A bitter electorate of frightened people turns overwhelmingly against the party in power, turns hopefully toward a new national leader, Franklin D. Roosevelt. His campaign promise, a new deal. His campaign song, happy days are here again. Franklin Delano Roosevelt on his inauguration day. In the tension and antagonisms of the moment, the defeated president and the president-to-be barely speak as they ride together to the Capitol for the swearing-in ceremony. The day is overcast and sullen, shadowed by uncertainty in Washington and throughout the land. For America, something is ending this day. Something is beginning, and no man can tell what. One thing only is certain on this 4th of March, 1933. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. From the 32nd president of the United States in his inaugural address come words that electrify a people desperate for hope and assurance. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Whatever may be said of him, this the people sense. He is not afraid. That night, the new president promptly breaks with tradition. He does not attend the inaugural ball. Instead, he launches immediately on a program of legislation and reform without precedent in American history. The New Deal begins at once. This nation, he has said, asks for action, and action now. Action begins next day, Sunday. With Secretary of the Treasury Wooden, the President orders every bank in the nation to close. The holiday begins in a holiday mood for most. But to assure the public that the banks will reopen safely, the president hits upon his most popular innovation, an informal report direct to the man on the street, the fireside chat. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. Now, every train to Washington brings its cargo of experts to join the great assault on the Depression. Economists, sociologists, statisticians, agronomists, idealists, world savers. Each with a pet panacea, a surefire system to save the country. Somebody writes a poem about it. Tramp, tramp, the grand old party's breaking camp. Blare of bugles, din, din. The New Deal is moving in. Along with master politicians like James Farley and Louis Howe, the president surrounds himself with bright young college professors, such as Raymond Moley, Rexford Guy Tugwell, and Adolf Burley, men who generate new ideas and new policies. They are the brain trust of the Roosevelt Revolution. 
Bill after bill pours into Congress from the White House. Whatever Roosevelt wants, he gets. The House is burning down, says the Republican floor leader. So give the president anything he needs to put out the fire. Through 100 historic days of a special session, every New Deal measure passes without question. The country demands bold, persistent experimentation, the president says, and the country gets it. Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace launches the AAA, a program for managing and controlling America's farm resources. The new Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, administers the PWA, a program of public works designed to create jobs for the unemployed. The Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, first woman cabinet member, expert in employment problems, an advocate of economic planning. Something like a war psychology grips Washington as the shakeup in government goes on night and day by headlong trial and error. Everything from federal theater projects to legalizing light wines and 3.2 beer. And an alphabetical avalanche of new offices and agencies. FERA, CCC, TVA. But the most urgent measure in 1933 is NRA, a system of codes administered by General Hugh Johnson to regulate wages, hours, and employment. Even Will Rogers gets behind it. Hello. This is, uh, this is taken in, uh, in the uh, general part of General uh, Johnson's uh, NRA headquarters. I have been here all night and all the day working with him on uh, a comedian's code, code for comedians. And we've had quite an argument. He wants to include the senators and the congressmen in this, and I'm fighting against that uh, because us amateurs do not want to be classed with professionals. And I'm arguing with this guy, Johnson, and he's tough, boy, he's tough, this fella. The thing has got to work. Uh, this whole NRA system has got to work or else, I mean, and, and or they say, or else what? Well, just else, ain't gonna be nothing if it don't work. So all America rallies round the Blue Eagle, the symbol of NRA, the National Recovery Act. Will it work? Will it spread employment and raise wages? Well, Hugh Johnson has no doubt. If every employer will live up to the code or to his agreement under which he got the Blue Eagle, if every consumer will buy under the Blue Eagle and buy generously now to the very full of his prudent needs, American business and employment will show the biggest spurt that it has known for years, and we are on our way out of this depression before snow flies. Government by ballyhoo, some call it, and denounce NRA as national regimentation, alien to the American way. But most are caught up in the color and excitement of the times. Hasn't Roosevelt said, we are on our way and heading in the right direction? passes out. At 35 and a half minutes past three on December 5th, 1933, Utah becomes the 36th state to ratify the 21st Amendment, repealing the 18th. Beer is back, not just 3.2, but real beer. Eight states remain dry, but in the other 40, what's yours? Anything goes. <laughs>
new day in new times. And who can say what will happen before another morning rolls around? Things are going on all the time nowadays that would have seemed impossible a few years ago. Some people worry what effect all these changes and reforms will have in the long run. But the New Dealers say people don't eat in the long run, they eat every day. So the changes keep coming. What's going to happen next? We don't know. We can't say. We're wondering. One thing that's happening, men are going to work for the government by the millions on new buildings, roads, schools, bridges, anything to get the forgotten man, as Roosevelt calls him, off the bread lines and on the job, any job. WPA. It stands for Works Progress Administration, but critics say it really means we poke along. The boondoggling, the shovel leaning, becomes the target for anti-administration wits. And against the most spectacular of New Deal projects, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, opponents charge unfair government competition with private business. But TVA generates cheap power for millions of homes and factories in a blighted area. It works and it grows. Few object to the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. It takes thousands of young men out of the towns and cities where there is nothing for them to do and puts them in government camps where there is plenty to do. Work that conserves the soil and replenishes the forests. On the farmland, a paradox. The New Deal promises the more abundant life. But in the farm belt, abundance is a burden. Now, government agents go about preaching the gospel of crop control, the economics of scarcity. Farmers are paid not to plant. The AAA, the Agriculture Adjustment Act, seeks to bolster farm income by ordering crops plowed under. And millions of acres of wheat, cotton, corn are left unplanted. And yet, men are hungry. That such measures are needed, says Secretary Wallace, is a shocking comment on our civilization. But farm prices do go up, farm income rises. To the troubles man makes for himself in the 30s, nature adds disasters of her own. Hurricanes, floods, drought. Steinbeck tells the tale that is told of the Okies, and he calls it the Grapes of Wrath. They took the migrant way to the west. In the daylight, they scuttled like bugs to the westward, and as the dark caught them, they clustered like bugs near to shelter and to water. And because they were lonely and perplexed, because they had all come from a place of sadness and worry and defeat, and because they were all going to a new mysterious place, they huddled together. They talked together. They shared their lives. They were not farm men anymore, but migrant men. The voice of the demagogue is heard in the land. Senator Huey Long of Louisiana. With his rabble-rousing shout of share the wealth, he makes his bid to become dictator of America. The Reverend Gerald L. K. Smith, Father Charles E. Coughlin, Dr. Francis E. Townsend. Together and on their own, they woo the frustrated and bewildered with slogans and panaceas. Dr. Townsend calls his patented cure-all the old age revolving pension plan, and he claims five million followers. The radio priest, Father Coughlin, wins a growing following by scoffing at democracy and playing on racial prejudice. Thousands of Americans, fearful of the expanding threat of communism from the radical left, turn in their anxiety to the extreme right. 
The Reverend Gerald Smith falls heir to the Share the Wealth movement when a political enemy murders Huey Long. I always talk loud, says the Reverend Gerald Smith, and too many come to listen and believe. It can't happen here, the saying goes, but it seems to be. From Hyde Park on the Hudson, a different voice. Franklin Roosevelt relaxes with his wife and grandchildren at his ancestral home. Out of this patrician background has come his sweeping program of social security and reform, a lifetime in public service. Despite inherited wealth and privileged position, he has somehow acquired the common touch that endears him to the common man. A personal magnetism and inner buoyancy have smoothed his path in politics. Once he said to Orson Welles, you and I are the two best actors in America. His second home is Warm Springs, Georgia, where he finds relief in the mineral waters. Infantile paralysis deprived him of the use of his legs at the age of 39. The President of the United States is the first man in history to achieve world stature without the ability to walk. His affliction, says his wife Eleanor, gave him strength and courage he had not had before. But though a cripple, he is no invalid. At Warm Springs, he becomes Dr. Roosevelt and frolics with his fellow victims whom he calls my gang. We are going to make it a crusade, says Roosevelt of his campaign for re-election in 1936. Though major New Deal measures like NRA and AAA have been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, millions of men have been put to work and the National Business Index has almost doubled. All across the land, the president is hailed as a gay crusader who has led his nation out of the economic wilderness without dictatorship or revolution. To the many who feel that happy days are here again, he is FDR, the champ. crusade rolls across the country led by the Republican candidate Alf M. Landon, able governor of Kansas, successful oil man, middle-of-the-road conservative. For him and for many, the basic campaign issue is that of governmental power and its abuse. He says, The question raised for this issue, what powers the government shall have and what powers it shall not have, can be the difference between representative government and an organized authority wielded by one man. Against that one man, that man in the White House, the Republicans charge that he is destroying the American way of life, that he is leading the country down the road to socialism, that he is Franklin Deficit Roosevelt, whose spending has increased the public debt by billions. Let's make it a land and slide. Election night, 1936. Roosevelt takes every state in the Union but Maine and Vermont and wins huge majorities in both houses of Congress. It is the greatest political sweep in history. During his campaign, the president said, this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. The United States, moving toward that destiny, enters the second term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt.